We are looking at a question today. But the question is posed for us directly in Job 25.4. And we're taking just part of the verse here. Can a man be justified with God? When we look at Job 25.4, what it actually says is, how then can man be justified with God? So it's not a matter of if it can occur, but we have a transition then. How then can a man be justified with God? And in order to understand the transition, of course, we have to look to the verses that preceded it. In Job 25.2, we read, Dominion and fear, which is really awe of God, are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. So it's talking about God's character and how it's at one in the heavenlies. And then so in Job 25.4, we read, How then can man be justified with God? And he continues, Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? So, so we're looking at a problem here. We understand that in the heavenly relationship that it's at one, but with man, it's not. And really the condition that we're talking about is given to us in Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so it's saying we're caught in a condition that despite our best efforts is unacceptable. And so this is the reason really that this question was posed in Job 25. How then can a man be justified with God? How can they come into a relationship with God? Because God cannot view unrighteousness. And we're further told in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, not one. We know that this principle is laid forth in the Old Testament. In Exodus 33, verses 22 and 23, we have the concept that mankind can't even look on the face of God because they're unrighteous. And this is the account, of course, with, uh, with Moses. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock. You know, this is the nature of that expression, being put in the cleft of the rock, protected. And I will cover thee with mine hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. But my face shall not be seen. Because we realize that no man could see God and live, because mankind is unrighteous. So that was incompatible. But yet in Matthew, you know, we're kind of going back and forth. In Matthew 5, 8, we read, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So are these two things at odds? Is Matthew 5, 8 really going to come true? And so the question, how can a man be justified by God? How can they see God? How can they obtain righteousness? Really what we see is we see almost a trap. A trap where there's no way out. Except the scriptures are giving us clues that there is a solution to this problem that seems like can't be solved. In Hebrews 12:14, it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So it's giving us a key here that there is a way prescribed where? In the scriptures. So the scriptures are going to give us the formula for how we can be justified, how we can come back into a relationship with God. And that's the key to getting out of this seeming trap that has no exit. When we look at the word justification in the New Testament, it, to, it describes to regard as just or innocent. Notice what it doesn't say. It does not say to pardon. It does not say to pardon. It says to regard as just or innocent. In the Old Testament, the word there means to make right, to do justice, and to turn to righteousness. So this is giving us also... Uh, you know, the thought that it's not only just an act, but there is actions required on our parts as well. And so it requires a turning to righteousness, which is to say righteous living. The beginning of this path is to turn to righteous living. You know, in the world we can go out and there's 4,000 plus religions now in the world, we're told. And all of them have their leaders and their deities and they all have ways of 
uh, getting to God. But what God is telling us here is there is one way, and I'm going to prescribe it. And the first step is to turn to righteousness, to turn to righteous living. And that's a prerequisite. You know what a prerequisite is? It's what you've got to do to get in the door. You know, if you have a prerequisite for a class, it's what's required before you can attend that class and try to pass that class. And so it's saying the prerequisite is to turn to righteous living. That's the first part. Now, that's not enough. That's the prerequisite. It doesn't mean you pass the course. So what is justification? You know, classically we hear to make right or to be made right. But I'm going to add a little bit more because I think it means to be made right with God in the context of the scriptures. Because that's what the focus is in the scriptures. So it's to be made right with God. And so our question, just like the traps, how do we get there? And so the question is, how can man have a relationship with God? In Luke 19.10 we read, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. This is a veiled reference. What are they talking about? Well, that which was lost. If we turn to the first book of the Bible, we have the answer. What was lost in the Garden of Eden? Well, we realize that Adam willfully sinned, and as a result, all of his progeny since then have been unrighteous. None of them was perfect. And so... The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, which the other thing that was lost was a relationship with God. Remember, Adam walked in the garden in the cool of the evening and he spoke with God, so there was a relationship. And once he had willfully sinned and was banished from the garden, that relationship was shattered. And that is why there is a requirement to try to come back into a relationship with God. So the beautiful thing here is the scriptures are telling us as a harmonious whole how this whole thing works, why we need it, and the steps to come back into relationship with God, which we know is justification. What is the source of justification? Once again, the scriptures give us the answer. So if we study carefully and precisely, we will see the answer. In 1 Corinthians six eleven, we read, Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And so there are two components here. You're justified in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the avenue. That's, that's how you get there. And by the Spirit. The mechanism is further given to us in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 through 26. And here we really have kind of a road map to justification being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Remember, what? through Christ and by the Spirit of God. So this harmonizes. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So it's not just belief in Christ, but faith in his blood. And when we see that word blood, it has a very specific meaning. We're given that meaning really in the sacrifices of, of old, but it required blood. And when we talk about being coming under the blood, we talk about a covenant by sacrifice. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And so it's saying that his righteousness can be declared in all the world and ask forgiveness for our sins. How? Through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So God is the justifier of those who would believe, who follow this path. And so what we've seen here is we've seen that it requires the blood and belief in the blood and the covering of the blood. It requires a declaration of our sins. It requires the forbearance of God, God's intervention, and it's all done through Jesus. So this is the only avenue through which this can be done. Very specific formula given here. Now there are those in the uh, Bible, especially in the Old Testament, that were, as we describe, justified to friendship. 
Now we don't have that phrase per se, word for word, in the Old Testament. But here in James 2.23, we have a description that leads us to that statement. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. And being imputed unto righteousness is what we call justified. He was justified in God's sight. And so thus, the expression justified to friendship. And we realize when we turn to Hebrews chapter 11, we talk about the heroes of faith. And what it says, all these died in the faith. They were all friends of God. And so they were in this special relationship with God, imputed for righteousness. But there's another type of justification described in the scriptures as well. First John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now let me ask you a question. Is there a difference between friends and between sons and daughters? Yes, there is. It's a very special relationship. It's a blood relationship. It's a family relationship. It's a relationship that involves inheritance. And so right here in First John, we're given a description that this justification, this, this special situation, is that we should be called sons of God, come into God's family. And he continues, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. It's promising. And once again, remember, it says that no man could see God, and yet here it is promised that this is the mechanism by which we shall see God. This is a very special relationship. So what's the difference? In Matthew 11.11, 11, we read, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, so this is an addendum, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That doesn't seem fair on the surface, does it? John the Baptist was the greatest, but because of the relationship the only relationship he could have with God, it was a relationship of being a friend of God. Not because of what he was or because of his faith, but because of when he was developed. But in Hebrews 11, 39 through 40, we read, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. There was a special promise, but because of their faith, they received a promise, but not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Once again, this is veiled language. But when we understand God's overall plan, and we understand that there will be a general resurrection, and we understand that the Christ head and body will participate in that, we understand the meaning of this, that they without us should not be made perfect. They would not be brought up from the grave except through the sealing of the body of Christ, those body members. So justification to sonship is superior as described in the scriptures. It involves a, an inheritance, a very special inheritance. Now what are the steps towards justification? Romans 8.30 Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And so this sounds very nice on the surface, but what's being given here is some very specific steps to coming into a relationship with God. And the first thing we realize is there's predestination. Those that are capable of fulfilling a vow such as this. There's a calling. And when we call, it's kind of like calling for supper. If you don't hear the call, you don't come to supper. And so by its very nature, there's a sifting that goes on here. There's some that were capable that maybe 
were called and didn't respond to the call. They didn't come in. And what happens when you are called to supper and you don't come in? Well, you don't get to eat. The next step was justification. Does he justify? So it's telling us that in order to be justified, you have to be predestined, called, and then, and then can you be justified. And if you're successful, what's the last step? Glorified. We have another place in the scriptures that give us in a little bit different terms. And we find this in Revelation 17, 14. They that are with him, so this, this is the glorified church, are called, chosen, and faithful. And so if we add that dynamic into this, we see called, chosen, and faithful. The faithful ones are glorified. And so we see very beautifully here this path as it is. These are the stepping stones that must be taken in order to be justified. There is no other way. This is what the scriptures prescribe as the pathway to come back into a relationship with God. When we think about it, the parable of the wedding feast is really a parable that talks about this process. In Matthew 22, verses 2 through 5, we read, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatling are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And then continuing, And a remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he saith unto his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. And continuing we read, Go ye therefore into the highways, as many as ye shall find, and bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding feast was furnished with guests. We continue. But when the king came to see his guests, he saw a man there which had not on a wedding garment. Now, we, we're going to pause here for a moment and describe the process of this wedding ritual. When you came in the door, you were given a wedding garment. So everybody who came in through that door had a wedding garment on. But you'll notice the term here. He noticed a man which had not on a wedding garment, which is also showing he had taken it off. He had removed it. And then we continue. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? Because, of course, the king knew that it was required. So this is a rhetorical question. And the man's response was, And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And of course, when we look at this overall parable, we realize that that first invitation went out to the natural Israelite, the Jew. They rejected him, and they despised him, and they killed his prophets. And God was angered. And God cut them off, just as he said in the parable. And then it went out to, to the highways and byways, and it went to the Gentiles as well. And they came in. And the majority of them kept their wedding garments on. But this one individual didn't. What does that show? Really, when we come under Christ, when we make a covenant by sacrifice, where it is said that we are under the robe of righteousness. And we find this expression in Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, 
My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. And so here we have the key to what the robe represented, the Christ robe of righteousness. The garment of salvation had to do with what? The ransom. Belief in the ransom. Acquiring that ransom and, and uh, embracing that ransom. And then the covering stayed on. And that really had to do with the sin offering because once we are justified and our, our consecration is accepted of God, we still need to be covered until we can be brought to that perfect standard. And that is the need for justification. So we see both in here the ransom, the initial covering, that's the avenue we got it, and the sin offering, the continued covering for sin. So it covers our imperfections. So we see in the parable, if you take that robe off, you don't have a covering, you don't have a standing, and you cannot be made righteous. It requires this. There's no turning back. Viewing justification. Now when we look at the word justification, it has the same uh, root word as our English word justice. Now, what does that mean? I like to think of it this way. Being justified is being legally righteous. And there's an avenue prescribed to how you can do that. And there's a specific steps along the way. And this is what God has prescribed for the way to come back into a relationship with him. So it's being made legally righteous, not actually righteous. And now we can harmonize and see how that trap that mankind's caught in, because God has prescribed this is the way to come out of that trap, we now understand the importance of being justified in God's sight. When we make a, uh, a covenant or a contract, as we would say today, it's a two-step relationship. So in today's world, I would go out on Craigslist and I would say I have a uh, washing machine and it's $300. And if someone calls up and says, I accept your offer and they give me a check, then that's a, a legally binding contract, an offer and an acceptance. And that's the way it works in our world. Justification works a little bit differently. When we look at our covenant by sacrifice, which is how we come into this, the same covenant that Jesus uh, founded really there's the steps of being called of consecrating and then God justifying called, consecrating and justifying what are those equivalents of? well from a contractual standpoint we have an offer an acceptance and then an acceptance well this is a little different than our legal contract that we just described God provides an offer that's the call we accept it. That's when we consecrate our all to God. And then God's acceptance is noted by justification. Now, why is that the case? It really shows the wisdom of God. Because there are some who might hear the call but weren't yet ready to answer the call. And there are some that might think that they've heard the call and never really could fulfill their vows. And so God in his infinite wisdom only accepts consecrations that can be fulfilled. That's the reason. So justification really represents that seal of God that now you are entering into a special relationship with him. Let's look at some of the changes that occur with justification. Is it just justification and what does that mean and what's the outward manifestation of that? That would be a little problem, wouldn't it? Let's look at what the scriptures once again have to say about this. In Galatians 3.11 it says, No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And remember we said the, first, the prerequisite was to live righteously, righteous living, and now we're entering into a relationship. The just must live by faith. In Galatians 3.8 we read, and all scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. 
And so it's showing us this very special relationship that those that are justified will have. They're going to have an opportunity to bless all nations. And it requires faith. It requires faith because, you know, these are written promises that we understand through the power of the Holy Spirit that combine together to provide this pathway. But it requires the step and the leap of faith. Salvation, the next thing that comes with justification. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than now being justified by his blood, and we talked about how that was important, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So there's a salvation that's going to come. And it's a salvation uh, based on the covenant by sacrifice. In Galatians 3.29 it says, If ye be Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now we're getting in. It's starting to tell us what that promise is. It's the Sarah feature of the Abrahamic covenant. A very specific thing. And that's the promise that those that are being developed in the scriptures, it's called the church. They're being developed under this very th special thing. This covenant by sacrifice. And without that, that's the only way to come into a relationship with God and to be justified. The only path. We're told that if we have this, we also receive another thing. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, once again, that faith element is inseparable. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So a very special relationship. And as a result, we receive the peace that passeth all understanding. So peace, despite the fact of, of death and all the, all the things that happen in our lives and will touch our lives, we still have peace with God. We're also promised that we'll receive the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6.11 we read, We are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit is the actuating power of God in our lives. It enlivens us, it enlightens us, and it empowers us. And so right here, linked again together, these are inseparable. I want to make the, this point. When you are justified, these things come. They are part of the package. They are inseparable. And the scriptures give us these promises. We're also told in 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore if any man be in Christ, if he comes into a relationship and makes that covenant by sacrifice, he is not he will be, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so the concerns of the mind, the new creature mind, the spiritual side of the mind takes over and is energized. This also is integral to justification. In James 1.18 we read, Of his own will begat he us with a word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We're also given another thing. We're told that we would be sons of God. In Romans 8.14 we read, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, and remember we just said they receive the Spirit of God, they are, not will be, they are the sons of God. So a very special relationship of being ushered into the family of God. In Titus 3.7 we read, that being justified by His grace, and any time I see this word grace, I think about the grace covenant, the Sarah feature of the Abrahamic covenant. That's another thing that we see. So whenever you see this word grace, he's talking or maybe alluding to that. Being justified by his grace, that's the covenant, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. A very, very key promise. In 1 Peter 2.9 we read, according to New American Standard, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And hasn't that been the goal of the church throughout history, is to proclaim the glorious gospel of the kingdom? That's his marvelous light. 
that's the thing that we've seen is not seen by others. We're also told that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. So he sees and he hears them, we're told, directly. In Hebrews 4.16 we read, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. How do you do that? It's through prayer. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. And so it's saying that we go, the world has the, the privilege of, of praying and praise to the Heavenly Father, but it's saying that those that are in this justified condition have a very special, special relationship. They can come boldly to the throne of grace. And that Jehovah God, his eyes and his ears are upon them. So these are wonderful promises. So we see when God accepts a consecration, when he justifies one, they go from darkness to light. They go from servitude to sin to sonship. They go from the old creature, the fallen flesh, to new creature mind. They go from praise and petition to prayer that goes boldly to the throne of grace. They go from the trouble of this world to being enlightened into God's plan and having the peace of God and peace with God. They go from being a fallen sinner to a justified believer. And they go from having the spirit of the world to the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Why does he do this? There's one word that I thought of as I reflected on this. This is empowerment. Because if you're going to fulfill your covenant by sacrifice, you have to be empowered. God provides everything that's necessary. Remember we said that God would not accept a consecration and justify one who was incapable of fulfilling that vow. But once he's done that, he's got to give you everything that you need, and then it's all on the battlefield of the mind. Can you fulfill your vow? Empowerment. That's what justification is all about. Empowerment to fulfill your covenant by sacrifice. How does justification occur? Here we have a reprint that gives us the answer. It says here, the justification of the gospel church is an instantaneous work, which means at the time God accepts a consecration, he justifies. You have all of these mechanisms that we just described. Prayer, peace, and all those other things. The new creature mind. That's all available. Those are all available resources instantaneously when God uh, accepts the justification. So why are these things needed? In 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, some scriptures we're all familiar with and we love. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Right living. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So here's the reason. All of these things were given. It's empowerment. It's so that we can be thoroughly furnished unto good works and that we might be made perfect. That's the reason. It's to fulfill our covenant by sacrifice. When God justifies, God empowers. He removes a lot of the impediments of the flesh. Does this mean we won't have trials? Absolutely not. We will have perhaps severe trials, but all of these things will be present to help us, what? In every time of need. Justification also has a very solemn side to it. In 1 John 5, 16 and then 19 it says, There is a sin unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. It's saying, Living right, that's saying, you know, staying away, from, avoiding sin, that's saying, asking for forgiveness. And the goal was, and that the wicked one toucheth him not. 
That was really shown by those in the wedding feast that kept the gowns on. In Hebrews 10, 26 and 27 we read, For if we willfully sin, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, full enlightenment, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Thus the solemn nature of being justified. And it's saying that if we willfully sin, we're going to look a little more at what that means, after we've been justified, there is no more covering for sin. You can't be justified multiple times. And that's what it's telling us. Any individual can only be justified once. And that's why we're on trial for our very lives. So the merit can only be imputed once for any individual. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, we read, It is impossible for those that have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. Isn't that just what we just described, the justified? All of those things, those are all facets. It's impossible, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again. So the merit can only be applied once. And that's the solemn nature of this. You can only be justified once. In Galatians 5.5 5 we read, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We walk in faith. And through the Spirit, through the enlightening power of God, that's how we receive this. And so we see here this formula of how important this is. In, Le in Leviticus 20, verses 7 and 8, we read, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am the Lord your God. This is really what God wants. Remember, there's another statement in the New Testament. What's the will of God concerning us? Even your sanctification. What does sanctification mean? It means to be made holy. And so it's saying, take all of these things that I have empowered you with, you are justified in my sight. You have a relationship with me. We want you to focus all your attentions, all your energy on being made pure or holy, to be righteous. And we do this through faith. The goal is, according to 2 Corinthians 6, 1, that we receive not the grace of God in vain. This is our desire for each and every one of us who have made this covenant by sacrifice, that have entered this narrow way, that have been justified, and that are daily working out their salvation with fear and trembling, is that they receive not the grace of God in vain. Receiving the grace of God in vain is taking off that robe of righteousness and discarding it, or taking it off for a time. The scriptures are giving us this pathway, as it were, to come back into a relationship with God. This is our desire for all the footstep followers of God. We have an awesome, wonderful Heavenly Father, a Father who is loving, a Father who has laid out His plans in the scriptures and has shown mankind how they can come back in a relationship with Him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen.